Okay. This is 1 Thessalonians lesson number 109. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's read the passage there, verses 1 through 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. A little bit of review. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we give you, gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, every, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto, holy, unto holiness. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. And as always, I just pray for the blossoming of your word, even more so in our inner inner man, and that when we speak about you, everything just be down to your glory. Amen. Now, Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in liberty where Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Last week, we spoke about the whole world is entangled with religion of some sort or another. The gospel of God's grace, Acts 20, 24, is the only thing that isn't entangled. It is free, it's clear, there's no entanglement. Now, we talk about wisdom and prudence. They're different words. Prudence is different than wisdom. It implies more caution and reserve than wisdom, or is exercised more in foreseeing and avoiding evil than in devising and executing that which is good. This gives us the big picture. If you don't rightly, rightly divide the word of truth, if you don't understand the word of God, rightly divided, you can't get that panoramic view. You can't get that big picture because you're trying to fit things where they don't, they're not supposed to be. Events do, have, do not have meaning unless you assign meaning to it. Now, you know how I feel about this. You can say God did something, but you cannot say the God of the Bible did it unless the God of the Bible says he did it. When somebody tells me God told me this or God told me to do that, I says, I'm not trying to be nasty here, you know, but if you can show me the verse with your name in it and God giving you that position, that, that, that word, I'll believe you. That's how, I mean, most people say that they don't even realize what they're doing and they don't understand. That's confusing to a lot of people. Um, he did it. You might say, maybe he did it and didn't tell us. That's why last week we read Ephesians 1, verses 8 through 9. He told us everything he's going to do. Ephesians 1, 8 and 9. Wherein he had abounded toward us, and all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. Colossians 125 says, it was given to him, to Paul, to fulfill the word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 17 says, it was by my mouth so the preaching might be fully known. For people to reject Paul is rejecting God. Paul wrote the final words from, of God in 13 of his, of his epistles. How do I know? Well, let, me, let me back. There is no will he didn't tell us about. This is a major problem in Christianity. How do I know he won't interrupt the mystery program with another mystery? Read Paul's epistles and read, again, Ephesians 1, 8, and 9. Let me do it again. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. All means all. If you want Pauline, you cannot see the big picture, and you don't have prudence. I'm not trying to be nasty or angry, or sloppy or whatever. You, you just don't, you don't understand that. If you don't, 
In 1 Corinthians 2, I'm going to read the passage here, verses 6 through 8. This passage, if you don't understand that the following passage is the most important piece of good news in Scripture, you're not going to understand how God's working today. The most important, because this passage connects with every other part of the Bible. Paul's final message, the capstone of progressive revelation, fits in with every other part of the Bible. He started back here, he goes over here, now we finally end up in the dispensation of grace. The last seven years of Israel's judgment has been put off for almost 2,000 years, and we've been here learning about the gospel of grace. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Now this particular passage, um, I have twin sisters. One of them's with her grandson, Landon, so I say hi to Landon. Both my sisters, when they heard this passage, they did a double take. It got both of them. Now they're in the great school of the Bible. They're studying. And they're one of their husbands is too. Let me read it to you. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This truth represents the whole Bible. What's so hard to understand about that? Hope is a confidence based on a credible promise. God promises eternal life. God promises that we cannot lose salvation. He says, once you're saved, you're always saved. If we believe that, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. In other words, you can say, I can give it away. You can't give it away. He's in you. Whose promise, promise is it? Yours or his? Please understand that. It's his promise. He's not going to go back on his word. Can you act like a heathen? By all means. Can you sound like a heathen? Yeah. Can God? If he said he's put his Holy Spirit in you and you can't lose it, you're sealed unto the day of redemption, is that something you can believe? We'll talk about that in a minute. The God of the Bible... Has, sovereign, has the sovereign free will that King Nebuchadnezzar had. When circumstances change, he has free will to change, the decree, to change his decree. Free will is a Bible truth. It applies to God and has been given to man. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 33. <clears throat> We've talked about this verse before. And this should remind you of Romans chapter 9. Exodus 33. Now, when people say that there's, not, there's only one church in the Bible, there's only one gospel and all that, but it's, you know, it's, the debate gets interesting, let's put it that way. God has not changed in his integrity, in his character, in his holiness, but his dealings with mankind have. What did man eat before the flood, before Genesis 9, in the first part of the Bible? Fruits and veggies, right? What did he eat? What can you eat now in Genesis 9? Meat, if you can catch it. What did God do with Israel and their dietary regulations? Do we follow that? Now, what does Timothy say? We, no, you can eat anything you want as long as it's received with thanksgiving. That's a change in God's dealing with man. Did his character, holiness, and integrity stop, change? No. But that's what people think when we try to tell them about Dispensational Bible study. They made it like a four-letter word. Here's a verse that shows it. Exodus 33, way back here, ties in with Romans 9. Can you believe that? This whole thing fits together with the capstone of progressive revelation. Right? And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Huh? I'm sorry. That didn't sound right. I'll get there. Hold on. I was? Hmm? 
Oh, I didn't. Okay. Thanks for reading. Well, anyway. Okay. Exodus thirty-three nineteen, All the way back here. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. If you read Romans 9, that fits in there. God has given himself permission to work outside of his covenants when needed. He doesn't change in his integrity, his character, his holiness, his judgment. His dealings with mankind have changed. How come for the last 2,000 years, he says, in his eyes, there's no Jew or Gentile, male, female, bond, or free? Was that the same in the Gospels, the Old Testament? Is that a big change? Why do you think we have so much trouble in Christianity? They don't want to believe it. They don't want to understand the, the, the fact that God is so generous and, and kind and mercy, the, the Bible words for this dispensation. So what is God's sovereignty, sovereign will today? Back on your outline. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Why, Paul? To the glory of the Father. The Lord's ultimate will is to glorify the Father through the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of all authority throughout the universe. Heaven and earth. Now, you know how I always pre say we preach reality? Okay, give, give another something to think about. When I say we preach reality, we preach the fact that the death rate is still one apiece. We know we're all going to die. We're living in this present evil world. But you can know some things. You can make a choice when you're alive to spend eternity in heaven, not in hell. There is no purgatory or limbo. That's an invention of religion. Man is a spiritual being manifested in a physical being. We sing a hymn. If we lose the songbook, did we lose the music? No. The song is a spiritual manifestation. The song is a spiritual manifestation of the writing in the book. The song is more than the physical copy of it. We call this intellectual property. Could you give that name to the Bible for God? Intellectual property? Who wrote the Bible? We store it as a physical copy. We live in a dualistic reality. This is a word I've added. Reality, but dualistic reality. What do I mean? God made a creation, heaven and earth, visible and invisible. That he might gather together, all right, all in one. Ephesians 1.10 again, six, fits Colossians 1.16, but let me read Ephesians 1.10 again. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's visible and invisible. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So what were the heavenly places? In the invisible places, they had thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. They have all that, just like we have down here. What things? Authorities in governmental positions. This is the issue. People don't like the Bible because it's negative toward man. You're a failure. You're a sinner. How does that make you feel? Do we want, do we want somebody to come up and tell you that? Would you be offended if somebody said that? I'm saying, right on. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> We're born that way. Call me a sinner? Well, you're, you're in the same club I, I am. You know. You don't have to get all freaked out. We have freedom. We, we, nobody can take it away. Stand fast in this liberty. Where Christ has made us free. It's unbelievable. People don't like an authority to answer to. 
the Bible version issue, King James Bible. Our Bible is our final authority in all matters of life. I have a Bible that is the absolute final authority in my language, the 1611 King James Bible. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There is invisible and visible, a dualistic reality. We have to believe in things that we can't see, but we know it's true because of what the Word says in our final authority. The moment I made that decision in my, my heart was the best moment. Nobody can come up to me and try talking in Greek or Hebrew because I, I was too old when I got saved to learn that, and I, I found out I didn't need it because we have a Bible in our, in our language. So people don't like an authority to answer to. Um, God the Creator is the absolute final authority in heaven and earth. Having a creation that willingly, with purpose and intent, by faith, submits itself to the authority of God in the heaven and earth. Now, the vast majority of my life, I've been self-employed. I can motivate myself. If you teach me, I'll go out and do the job. My family also has a strong worth ethic. My daughter, my son, my wife, my son-in-law, grandkids. When I joined the Marine Corps, when I got out, I said, I, I vow I will never do that again. I told you this last session. But I joined with my wife. Now I joined the body of Christ. So that has made the biggest difference in my life. And fortunately, I stuck around long enough to get my six siblings interested because they know me from the beginning. Who's going to listen to Ray when we know what Ray did in the past, right? We all have a history. But they did because they, they saw something. And when I told my sisters that if Satan thought when he, when he got Christ crucified, he thought he won it all. I got power over the heaven and the earth. I can control everything now. I say at 14, I want to be like the most I got. What happened? Christ resurrected. Satan's a chump. He made a fool out of Satan. Now, what this means for us and you, when you understand the dispensation of the grace of God and the gospel of grace, he's not very happy with you. Why do you think when we talk to other Christians like that, we try to bring this up unargumentatively, and they get upset. They've taken the word dispensational, shunk it down to four words and this dirty swear word. Why do they do that? Because they don't understand. And then understanding comes with a general understanding of the Old Testament, which we went over the first session, about the kings in Israel and all that. Had God chosen any other nation, it would have turned out the same way because we all come from Adam. That's a given. We're, we're sinners the moment we're, we're, we're born. Like I said before, do you have to train your children how to lie? Don't they get when about two years old, they know how to lie right away? Well, that's, that's, that's in us. Visible and invisible. These verses carry with them an understanding of what's going on in the universe. There is more powerful information than what we can see on any news station. And how many know about it? We do. This translates into studying your Bible dispensationally. Open your heart and your mind and heart to this scriptural truth. The Lord's ultimate purpose in having the creation honor him by free will, confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now you know how different this was growing up as a Catholic growing up? You know how sick sounding this was when I heard people doing this? I remember the incidents where I walked into people, met people that were saved. And they were trying to give me some of these words. You got, you're full of yourself. What do you mean you're a saint? Aren't we a saint in the most I got? Well, my wife and I got married in St. Raymond's. I'm, my name's Raymond. You know what I'm talking about. Philippians 2, 10 to 12. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth that's invisible and visible, and things under the earth. There's hell. 
that every tongue and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is, the, is, the, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, some of the Catholic people I know say this verse says you have to work for your salvation. It's not saying that. You can, now that you're saved, how are you going to handle yourself? How are you going to work? How are you going to think? What are you going to do? Are you going to renew your mind through the intake of sound Bible doctrine? Are you going to join the fight, the spiritual battle we're dealing with right now? Are you going to become a saint of the Most High God, which everybody is after they get saved? It is in this where you and I can participate in this plan. We receive an inheritance in the heavens connected with the earthly command center in Jerusalem. If you took a map, laid out the map of the earth, of the world, right? You see the different continents. It looks like they all fit together. Africa fits into South, Af South America. You know what I mean? Like, and if you put all that mass together, because it parted in Genesis, dead smack in the middle of that mass is the city of Jerusalem. That's the command center for the Lord Jesus Christ in the future. This heaven, the heaven and earth will be one. No more dichotomy of two kingdoms, of two groups, of two agencies. That's the church, the body of Christ in Israel. You know, the heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom. In this plan, in which God has determined to be head over all creation, we have received an inheritance. Our destiny as members of the body of Christ is predetermined according to the purpose of him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The Lord is working the reconciliation of the heavens and the earth according to his will. And we will participate in that as members of the church, the body of Christ. Participating in the agency that will reconcile the heavenly places. Now, God's going to use Israel to reconcile back the earth. He gave them the kingdom. But the church, the body of Christ, the heavenly places. Romans eleven fifteen, For if the casting away of them, talking about Israel, be the reconciling of the world, that's to restore to friendship and fellowship. God wants this. What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? You know what this tells me? God's not finished with Israel. Doesn't it say the same thing to you? Didn't he promise them a kingdom? Didn't he say they were going to be a nation of kings and priests? Are they a nation of kings and priests? Do they know Jesus Christ? Most of them don't. But do you believe that's going to happen? Yeah. And why do you believe that? You have a final authority. Again, getting saved like this just threw me completely off track of life. Because I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. And it put into me some understanding that I never had. So this is the sovereign will, the purpose of God, completely revealed in his world, in his word. Now what about me, individually? The three of us, me, myself, and I. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The law says you have to. Grace says you should. You get to make a choice. You get to be a big boy or a big girl. You get to make up your own mind. Am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? Who's telling me? Who, who do I follow? Myself? My, my spouse? My priest? My rabbi? Or his book? Does this sound like, the God, like God has a will for your life? Yes. So what is it? Paraphrased, that you will walk as his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are the new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 The one new man created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4.24 Now I have other verses here. In Oh boy. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16. 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now this little section right here, the reason I put it in there is because how many Christians do you talk to that believe there's only one gospel in the Bible? A lot, right? How many believe there, how many Christians tell you that there's no more, there's more than, there's only one church on the planet? Now we know from Acts 7, Moses had a church in the wilderness, didn't he? Then there's a church in, in Matthew 16, 18, on, on, on the Jews, that Peter confessing that Jesus Christ was their prophesied Messiah. Okay, that's the Jewish Messianic Church. They don't preach the gospel of the grace, they preach the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the, of the kingdom is, is, is the gospel of grace, it, it, and that's, it's, my gospel, it's the gospel of law. The law works wrath, not grace. And then there's the church, the body of Christ. For make him, himself of twain no man, new men, one new man, so making peace. Question. How much peace has this information brought us down here? Has it brought us any peace? Personally, collectively as a church, we have the Lord's Supper, we break bread, we feel glad about that. I talk to people, you tell me story. you know, you're going on in your life. There's peace there. But what about... Christianity, forget the other parts of the world. What about Christianity in itself? Do we have peace? No? We don't. We're, we're, we're trying to be peaceful at all costs, try not to offend people. If they're unsaved, the agape love tells us that we should esteem others better than ourselves. Well, Christ did. He died for us while we were still sinners. He hated us. Romans 5. We hated him, I mean. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One new man. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling. Ephesians 4.12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What is this body of Christ? Isn't this a church? Aren't we the church, the body of Christ? Did Peter talk about that? How about Elijah? Elisha, he had double the miracles that Elijah had. Nothing. Ephesians 5.23 For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he he is the savior of the body. Our wives want to know that we will give our lives for them. Submitting one to another. That's before you in Ephesians 5. Before you get into all those other verses about that. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. And again, the, we try to validate, we, we believe in, there's more than one gospel in the Bible, and we can show the people the verses, they can read it themselves. There's more than one church in the Bible. God has two agencies, one to take back the, the earthly realm, the other one to take back the heavenly realm. Now, the heavenly realm wasn't talked about until you come to Paul. There's visible and invisible correspondence. For as many as a for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jewish or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. We, right here sitting in this church, we are the church, the body of Christ. And Notre Dame is right down the road. This is part of the plan God had before the foundation of the world. He gave it to Paul, and Paul calls it a mystery. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, 
which was kept secret before the world began. But no. In Romans 2.16, Paul calls it my gospel. In 2 Corinthians 4.3, he says it's our gospel, the church of the body of Christ. He says something similar in Galatians 2.2, 2, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, our gospel, and 2 Timothy 2.8, my gospel. He says my gospel three times. The only person to, 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 to say that, my gospel. Peter never called it my gospel. Paul says it's my gospel. So it can't be Peter or James or John. It can't be their gospel. It's Paul's gospel. God most definitely has something for the church, the body of Christ, to do. Now, before we go there, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And let me read you verses 13 to 22. Remember now, we got Romans, First, Second Corinthians, Galatians, doctrine, reproof, correction. You got Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, doctrine, reproof, and correction. Ephesians is higher ground knowledge than Romans. Romans is the baseline. When you come to Ephesians, it's expected that you understand the previous three chapters. Verse thirteen. But now, in Christ Jesus, you sometimes were far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ. That, that would be us. For he is our peace, who hath broken both, who hath made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that's the hatred now, even the law of commandments, the law works wrath, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. And that he might reconcile both under God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which are afar off, and to them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fit friendly together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, we are the church, the body of Christ. We don't partake of this. We don't take, partake on the basis of, of covenant. We partake on the basis of grace, on the basis of the mystery, on the basis of the program where God has provided for our, our provided for us, people who are not part of the covenants. God has provided for our inclusion, not through Israel's rise, but through her fall. Now, You've heard me talking about Romans 11 quite a bit. People think we're grafted in, or they think we're a spiritual Jew. Or that's, not, that's not true. Um, and it can be confusing to a lot of people, but in this passage, let me show you something here. We've been grafted into and made a participant in the household of God. Okay? What did I just read? In whom all the building fitly for him together groweth unto an unholy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. He views this as a building. How can I put this? Look at verse 18 in Ephesians 2 here. For th through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. This is one of the great verses that show us the Trinitarian ministry. Verses 19 to 22 show us the, the details of the dispensational change that God made when he started this program. We're part of the overall program 
to bring the universe, universe back under the Lord's authority. Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. This temple is a living organism. It grows silently, and as, as new, new parts are added to it. When people get saved, when they understand the dispensation of grace and the church, the body of Christ. You can be saved and not understand this information. But if you don't understand this information, you have no prudence. You can't see the big picture. In Ephesians 2.16, And then he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. This is absolute equality. By the cross, it says, verse 16, there is a difference between the words how, let me back up. People use this verse to say that the body of Christ began at Calvary. Did they preach the gospel of grace at Calvary? Did the dispensation of grace start at Calvary? People use this verse to say that the body of Christ began at Calvary. There's a difference between the words how and when. There's a difference between the instrument by which something is accomplished and the time in which it was done. 1 Corinthians 1.18 talks about the preaching of the cross. Do they preach any good news about the cross before Paul? What did Peter convict them of in the early Acts? You just killed the Holy One, your Messiah. Where's the first time in the Bible you can read any good news about the shed blood of a person? Romans 3.25. You don't get that before Paul. You don't get it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or anybody else. This was a mystery. And had Satan known what the cross work accomplished, Christ would not have been crucified, as 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8 says. Because that was his undoing. God most definitely has something for the church, the body of Christ, to do. Now, I just read you that. This, this is where the dispensational changes come in. Are you a member? Then he has something, some things for you to know and do. Does he have a will for your life? Yes, he does. This does not mean he has a place for you to be at at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. This is who he wants you to be and how he wants you to function. Function wherever you are in the life and identity he has given you in his son. So instead of looking around to find the details of God's will for you, I don't see anything here, do you? Instead of looking around, his will is already revealed that you should live as a saint of the Most High God in and under any circumstances. It is who you are, when you are, where you are. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. First Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything, give thanks. How are you doing with that? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you get in a fight with your spouse, are you going to give thanks for that? After you let go of the anger. <laughs> like I said, God loves me and sometimes my wife. I'm a lucky man. Got to keep the humor going. Now, this is the blatant statement that teaches God's will for your life. In everything, give thanks. Even in the bad things. What do you learn with the bad things? Patience? Most of us are old enough to have bodies falling apart. So what are you learning? The outward man perishes. But it's the inward man that can grow. That's exciting. That's the will of God. I never had that information when I was a Catholic or younger. Or when I was, you know, I didn't get saved until I was 41 years old. What did I know? Nothing. The Lord doesn't care where you are. You believe that? He doesn't care where you are. He's not down here micromanaging our details in, the, in our lives. 
Wherever you go, give thanks. Being who he made you in Christ, obeying his word in you. This issue is the attitude you have toward being who you are. Is that going to check some bad behavior, some bad thoughts? Is that going to nullify that if you're thinking the right way? Then 1 Thessalonians 4b, God says that you should abstain from fornication. This is a revealed will of God for your life. We are to live within the revealed limits. Within these limits, we have freedom to make our own choices. Why does he mention fornication? 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Holiness and sanctification have the same meaning, to be set apart for the purpose for which it was created. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. Why? Unto good works. How do you get accomplished good works? What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about when you're dealing with somebody? Are you, if they're unsaved, what's on your mind? I know what's on your mind. You want to get them saved. Well, this, what's this going to do to you if you have that thought? You're going to try to be the best person you can to try not offend them. Because if they hear the word dispensational, they're probably going to kick you out of the house anyway. Check your behavior at the door. Check your attitude. You want this person to get saved. Why? Because you're, we're all hell deserving. This takes, takes everything, every, all these little nuances and things that trigger, trigger us, it, it just throws it all away, and we have that freedom now, Galatians 5.1, just go, you know, I got one purpose for this person, I'm not going to get him angry, no matter, even if he swears at me, yell, yells at me, I want him to get saved, so I'm going to be patient. Somebody was patient until Debbie and I came along. Shouldn't we do the same? This is a reasonable service, as Ro Romans talks about. Holiness and sanctification have the same meaning to be set apart for the purpose for which it was created. Now, th listen to this. Neither one means sinless perfection. I mean, none of you girls out here are perfect. Sinless doesn't mean sinless perfection. That's a, there's a freedom there, isn't there? Even if somebody gets angry with you or let you know, you don't have to get angry back because you've been given some freedom. And this is the kind of freedom everybody needs. It's always from the inner man. I am abstaining, if I am abstaining from fornication, there are places I may not want to go. Where is not the issue? But why am I going there? What is your intent? The issue of sanctification is to understand how to live in the details of your life. Wherever you are, as who God has made you, how would God live in you in that situation? He wouldn't live out the lusts of your flesh. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 4 and 5, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles would know not God. You're not to be living in the same way you were before being saved, though you may be in the same location. We were talking about this on the way here this morning. I'm in the same location. Guess how many friends I lost. Guess how many more I made. You can talk about any other topic in the world, but when you bring up God, that some people think you, you made a change in your life, and they know you from the past. Remember that girl that I ran into? I was in an oil change place, and one of my brothers went out, went out to date her there. I recognized her, and she saw, I said, well, how, how's things going with you? She goes, well, I just got divorced for the second time, and my son doesn't want to live with me. I'm thinking, well, wow, doesn't sound too good. Hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm pastoring a church in South Bend, Indiana. She goes, you? And she turned around and walked away. I had to bite my tongue to keep from laughing, but that's, that's actually what happened. You? Any other topic, she would, have, she would have done that. But, okay, she knew me then, I know me now. And that's just the way it works, I guess. 
This is sanctification, what I'm talking about. This is Paul, what Pauline truth is, is designed to do, to teach you and to lead you. Pauline truth is not designed for you to tell every church in town that they are wrong. It is designed to make you a vessel through whom Jesus Christ lives for the good of others and the glory of God. This is a high calling. Now, let me give the gospel as my ending prayer. For those of you watching, I sure hope you understand that. And Landon, uh, hi to you. I hope you're still watching. But for anybody who's watching that's interested, if you're not saved, my final authority says that you're, you're going to go to hell when you die. We don't want that because all, we're all hell, hell deserving. We want you to get saved. Understand that you're a sinner. Christ died for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. And now it's all for salvation. It's a free gift. So before you do anything else, make that choice in the privacy of your heart. Get saved. And you'll spend eternity in heaven. Thank you.